We don't yet know how that induces genome change, and I really mean actual change in DNA. And yet we know also that those processes must be able to do that because we can show that. So we put Dennis's genome in a petri dish. That's right. Yes. Um, and and keep it um, going for te for ten thousand years. Well, it wouldn't keep going. It would decay, as you as as you rightly say. However, the information it could be preserved on paper. You could actually write it down on a on a in a book on a, on a. You could carve the A T C and G um, I co codons in granite and, and keep it for 10,000 years and then in 10,000 years type it into a sequencing machine which we already have and it would recreate an identical twin oh, no, of I Dennis Noble. No, I don't think it would. You, you don't think it would? No, no. Uh, why not? Well, it would... <laughs> <laughs> it would need one. It would need uh, uh, an Excel. Uh, oh, of course it would. No, yeah. no. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, I think we need <laughs> the Excel. Yes. In in t in, t in ten thousand years, yes. they will they will have the technology You'd to take to an Excel. It, oh, I see. Okay, yeah. well, I, I now therefore need to follow up on a, a, a different issue then, if I may, Richard. Yes, um, because you see, y what it would need to be is a good self-replicator. And you won't be surprised that I disagree with you on self-replication, because I think that's a central feature. Uh, because I think without the self-replicator, I'm not quite sure that I understand what the selfish gene idea really means. Now, let me just explain briefly why it can't be a self-replicator. The, the way in which that arose goes way back to the quantum mechanics pioneer, Erwin Schrödinger, who in 1942 gave lectures in uh, the university, well not the university, the Institute of Advanced Studies in Dublin. He published it. And what he said in that book was very insightful. It was that whatever the genetic material was, whether it was DNA, protein, or whatever, it would be found to be a highly accurately reproduced molecular sequence. And he called that an aperiodic crystal. The word crystal matters there. Because you see, what you say, Richard, in your books is that it replicates much as a crystal does. Now, I think that's partly true, but unfortunately not sufficiently true. Because what exactly happens, let's just go through it, and this has got to be technical for about uh, 20 seconds or so. Um, what actually happens is, as we all know, the double helix discovered by Watson and Crick um, and Rosalind Franklin, you remember those images mm -hmm. that were produced yeah. by, <laughs> I see all the women and a few men clapping. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> anyway, what Rosalind was working on, very interesting fact, was not a crystal. Her work in that critical working out of the double helix was actually on the flexible thread that actually is the DNA in a cell. You can crystallize DNA, that was done much later, but not in a living cell, otherwise you can never read it. Now, why is the crystal me metaphor accurate to some degree, but not to sufficient degree? And it's worth just going through the figures, because they're very important. What happens as the double helix unwinds is a C finds its mate because it naturally likes the other one that it likes to come in and link to it. And the same applies to the T and, and, the G and so on. So every one of them has a mate. That's fine. Now that is a pure chemistry thing. And you could say that's almost like a crystal forming itself because what crystals do is that the other molecules that are in solution like to, in a lock and key fashion, go into the crystal. That's all fine. So in the same kind of way, and I think this is the reason why people like Richard say it is a self-replicator and rely on the molecular biology to say that, they're quite right up to a point. Now the question is up to what point? In all chemical reactions there's an energy of formation and breakage. And from that, you know how frequently it will go wrong. It's about, in the case of the nucleotides, it's about 1 in 10,000 nucleotides. Now, you might think that's fine. 
if you wrote a scientific article of 10,000 words and you had only one word as a typo, you would be very pleased. <laughs> but the trouble is that suffices for small viruses like coronavirus because as, as a mutation rate of 1 in 10,000 each time it's copied would be acceptable if you've only got, say, 10 or 20 or 30,000 as a, as a genome length. We have got 3 billion, and the difference is around a million fold. Now, how accurate is DNA replication? Obviously, that first stage, which is crystal-like, and I accept the metaphor there, is accurate up to about 1 in 10 to the 4. What is the accuracy when the cell actually divides and provides two new cells? It's 1 in 10 to the 10. Hardly a single... Uh, that's rather like a proofreader of 10,000 books, going through 10,000 books and making sure there's not a single error in the whole 10,000 books. How is that achieved? It's utterly amazing. It's achieved by the living cell. Because what then happens as the problem of the breakages, as we might call them, in the DNA formation from the double helix when it's unwound, what then happens is the whole army of enzymes go in and literally proofread the mistakes. And I only know, I mean, that's why I say you'd have to put my genome in 10,000 years uh, hence in, into uh, a living cell to do it. Now the question is, which living cell? Um, because, you see, that will provide all the material initially to enable it to be reproduced. So what I'm saying is that it cannot be a faithful replicator except in the presence of its vehicle, which is the living cell. So I don't think there can be a neat separation between the replicator and the vehicle. Proofreading is, of course, very important, and uh, that, that is one of the ways in which it's true that self-replication happens. What matters from an evolutionary point of view is that certain genes survive in the gene pool and others don't. Now the proofreading is very important, that helps the, the thing along, but what matters from the evolutionary point of view is the survival or non-survival in the gene pool of successful genes versus unsuccessful genes. Successful genes are the ones which statistically have a positive effect on their own survival through gene pools, and the way they do that is via their phenotypic effects, their effects upon a succession of bodies. In any particular body, we have a combination of good genes and bad genes, successful and unsuccessful, and the body will die or not, depending upon um, all sorts of factors. It may get struck by lightning, it may be eaten by a lion and wasn't look looking and so on. But on average, if a gene is successful, that what that means is that it has a beneficial effect upon a large number of bodies in which it, in which it finds itself. M very often it will find itself in the company of bad genes and then it will die anyway. But statistically, on average, certain genes will get through the 10,000 year time of, the of more than 10,000 years, millions of years, will get through uh, all those generations because of its average statistical effect upon a whole lot of bodies. And uh, others will not get through because of their average statistical effect upon a whole lot of bodies. That is natural selection. That is why animals are so good at what they do. It's why birds are so good at flying. It's why moles are so good at digging. It's why fish are so good at swimming. It's because of the average statistical effects of a whole lot of genes working together in concert with one another to make good phenotypes. And so all the complications of what's going on inside the body in embryology, all the proofreading, all the interactions, all the things that Dennis describes so wonderfully in his book, are completely irrelevant if what you care about is the survival over many generations of certain genes rather than, rather than other genes. 
Yes, I, I, I fully understand what you're saying, Richard, but I don't think you really answered my point because, you see, I was saying that none of that would happen without the cooperation at the least, and I would say the very active cooperation of the living cell, because as I said, it's only a living cell that can reproduce accurately. Yes. Now, I think w what, w what we need to do here is to get another element into this, because I think what you're really worried about is how can it be uh, that the body can actually change the genome? And that's the big question. Now, the reason we know that it can is that it, we know it controls it. That's the first step. So let's see first of all how that can be done. I have two very important colleagues have done the work I'm going to describe, so I'm going to credit them. Um, Dick Chen worked with me as a graduate student way back in the 1960s and is now working at the New York University of New York and um, has done part of the experiments I'm going to describe, and Anant Parekh, who is uh, a physiologist in the same department of, uh, as me in Oxford. And what they've done is absolutely beautiful. They've asked the question, you see, it's the relevant question that I think Richard is asking. How can it be that the surface of the body or of a cell, it might be that it's a unicellular organism, then it would be the surface of the organism. How can it know how can its nucleus know that there is a need to change? And we now know how that can be done. What they've shown is best described by imagining, first of all, that a single nucleotide is about the size of my fist. And it's, set, it's situated in the nucleus, so let's put that in the center of the cell. If we did that, on that scale, the surface membrane of that cell would be way up in Scotland. How on earth can it be that a signal through a receptor on the surface can influence the nucleus? And we now know how that can be done. What they both found doing different experiments in different cells was that calcium coming through protein channels in that surface membrane using the same metaphor, way, way up, up there in Scotland, creates a calcium concentration in a small subspace underneath the membrane, and that high calcium triggers a chemical reaction that produces a messenger. And that messenger gets attached to some extremely important proteins in the cell. Those proteins are called tubulins, and the name suggests what they do. They form tubes. Literally, there are tube trains in cells. And I'm not joking, because what happens is those tubulins run all the way through from one edge of the cell to another. They have little motors on them, little molecular motors, and they can attach a messenger molecule to the motor. And what then happens is phenomenal. They literally walk along the tubulin. It takes just a few seconds to go from that surface imagine on this scale, way up there in Scotland, to the nucleus. What does it do? In those experiments, it changes the gene expression levels in the relevant genes that matter for that particular function. Now, the only thing that's missing here, and I'm sure Richard will pick this up very quickly, so I'll say it myself, <laughs> is that uh, those are very recent experiments done 2016 and more recently 2018, I think it was. Anyway, the important point is that we don't yet know how that induces genome change. And I really mean actual change in DNA. And yet we know also that those processes must be able to do that because we can show that. For podcasts, talks, debates, courses and articles, visit the Institute of Art and Ideas. Click the link on screen now to IAI.tv.